Hello, I'm Jonathan Smith. I'm the lead pastor at One Church TO, and you're listening to the teaching time from our weekend gathering. We're an imperfect community of over 70 nationalities and five generations who are attempting to follow and shine Jesus in the greater Toronto area. Our vision, it's so simple. We want to help people from all walks of life know God, love people, and in turn, impact our city for good. We've designed these weekends to be meaningful, challenging, and encouraging, and I hope that's what you get from listening. Hey there, One Church TO. I'm so glad to be here with you this weekend and joining in on your series on titanium. I love this idea, talking about building resilience as we face the attacks that come at us from our enemy in our world. We're going to we're going to get to the specific piece of armor that we're talking about today, but I just wanted to say right at the very start, the part that that speaks to me the most about this scripture that we're looking at over these weeks is the part that says it's this stand firm that is promised right at the very beginning. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 6. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. And then verse 13, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, see, you will still be standing firm. I love that. I'm so grateful for that. I find it so encouraging that Paul says, listen, battles are gonna come and they're gonna be hard. And and the devil takes some nasty shots at us and he's, he's good at it. But at the end of the day, if we're still standing, that's a win. That's a win. And we might feel exhausted. We might feel a little beaten up. We might not feel like we're very strong. But God says, if we put on this armor, we are still going to be standing firm. And that's the goal. At the end of the day, we're not destroyed. At the end of the day, we're not devoured. We're not done in. I just think that the phrase still standing firm might be one of the most underrated statements of faith that there is. It's like, you know, if you picture the end of this epic movie and there's been a huge battle and you're, you're at the end in this scene and, and there's this, there's all this confusion and smoke and dust and noise and nobody's really sure what's happening and you're near, the end of the battle, you're waiting for things to clear and you're waiting for them to settle a little bit and nobody knows, has the person that was being attacked, have they survived? And people are looking and they're trying to tell to see, did they make it? And then the music swells in the background and there's maybe a shout in the distance and then the dust clears and, and there she is. She's still standing. She's, she's maybe a little bit weary, maybe a bit sore, maybe needs some, some first aid, but still standing, feet planted firmly on the ground, and you know she has won that battle. I love that. There's something powerful about a stance of of feet planted firmly on the ground. It speaks of, of resilience and of determination in the face of resistance. It's got this, I shall not be moved feel. And if you've got the right boots, the right shoes, then you're good to go. Now listen, I don't know about you, but when I'm walking into a high stress situation, the shoes matter. They got to be comfortable, but they also got to carry a little bit of power with them too. They need to make a statement that says, I'm here and I'm ready. In, uh, in the last church that I pastored, uh, I got kind of known, I was there for a long time, and I got kind of known for my shoes, although I didn't really mean to. I didn't have a lot of shoes, but I did have a few pairs of shoes that were fantastic. And apparently, I gained quite a reputation for it. You know, I remember one time walking up into the balcony of our church on a Sunday morning. It was before service had started. And I'm just trying to walk around and say hi to some people. And so I walked up into the balcony. There was two guys that were up there. And I went to say hi to them. And they looked a little bit hesitant. And then they looked down. And I said, what are you doing? What, what's the problem? And they said, well... We're just seeing what kind of shoes you're wearing, Pastor Patty, so we know if we're in trouble or not. (laughs) This is the reputation I had. Listen, there's something powerful about a fantastic pair of shoes. I don't know if I could stand firm in a nice soft pair of fuzzy slippers, but give me some powerful boots or some fantastic shoes and I'm good to go. That's what today's piece of armor is about. Shoes. 
Ephesians chapter 6 says, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. And then here we go. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Paul says that we need to have the right shoes in order to stand firm. And it's not just about protection, although that's important. It's also about, about readiness, about having firm footing, about being prepared ahead of time for whatever comes. And that, that readiness is based on peace. Solid shoes, solid footing, solid peace. Something that I can just, you know, plant my feet on. That's how I'm going to be still standing when the dust clears. Because let's be honest, before the dust clears, it's really hard to see what's happening. It's hard to see where the hits are coming from. It's hard to even see or recognize the enemy sometimes because it's this bullet of confusion. That's the bullet we're talking about today. This bullet of confusion is this, uh, this tool that our enemy uses to, to disorient us, to distract us, to cause us to aim for the wrong thing, to have us spinning around and completely off balance. We desperately need solid footing when confusion comes our way. I mean, can, can we just say out loud, if COVID has shown us anything, it's that confusion can take us down. We're just, we're just all spinning with information here and misinformation there. And, and all of you, the same as me, pivoting your work or your business, pivoting your home life, pivoting what's happening with your kids. Every time the rules change, it's confusing. And confusion is a, it's a huge problem in our society. It's messing with people. It's messing with your head. So you end up getting spinning and going back and forth and you become really unstable. And confusion is deadly. You know, I took a look um, through scripture to prepare for this. To, to And I saw kind of three kinds of confusion that, that I saw in scripture. Here's, here they are, okay? I'll just, I'll just go over them quickly. The first one is confusion that destroys unity. And by the way, if it destroys unity, it also destroys strategy and effectiveness. In the Old Testament of our Bibles, you see, uh, you see stories like this more than once. I'll just tell you one of them. A guy named Gideon. He's, he's an Israelite and he's, he's part of the nation of Israel. And they are being oppressed by their enemies, the Midianites. And God calls Gideon to fight. You can read the story yourself later. It's in Judges chapter 6. Gideon has no experience. He, he barely has any courage. He ends up with 300 warriors in the middle of the night. And they're, they're looking down. They're surrounding this encampment of Midianites. And they're looking down. And it, it says they're like a swarm of locusts. There's too many to number. And there they are in the middle of the night, Gideon and his 300 scared guys. And, and on their, on the signal, you know, the one, two, three count, they just, they just start making a whole lot of noise. They, they blow horns and they start shouting and they smash the covers on their lights. So the light comes on in the darkness. It's confusion and God uses it. So, so the Midianites end up, they just destroy each other while Gideon and his men just sort of stand there and yell a lot. The confusion destroys their unity. It destroys their effectiveness and their strategy. Much later on, you can read a story in, in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4. It's much later in Israel's history. They're trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which has been destroyed, and their enemies don't want them to rebuild. And, and Nehemiah is talking about that and says in chapter 4, verse 8, they all, the enemies, they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. Now, Nehemiah recognized that and he didn't allow it, but it still tells us confusion is an effective tactic against an otherwise united group of people. It can destroy their unity and that, that destroys their strategy and it destroys their effectiveness. And they, that group of people can, they get distracted and they start turning on each other. And they forget what their purpose is. They forget what their goal is. And they forget who the real enemy is. It's confusion that destroys unity. Number two, the confusion of mob mentality. 
There's a story in the book of Acts in the New Testament of our Bibles where Paul, who wrote this letter we're talking about, he's in Ephesus and he's having really great success. He's planting a church. It's growing. People are, are coming to Jesus and, and some business people in Ephesus, they get upset because Paul's success is actually uh, causing, it's hurting their business. So these business people, they start rumors and, you know, they get some slogans going. And the next thing you know, you read the story, there's a mob gathered and they're all really, really mad. They don't quite know what they're mad about, but they're mad. And they all gather in this stadium and it says in Acts chapter 19, verse 32, Inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. <laughs> I mean, it's all of this useless energy that's being expended. And they're pretty sure they're taking a stand for something. But really, they're not quite sure what it is. And nothing good, nothing productive is coming from it. It's the confusion of mob mentality. Now listen. Can we just agree that social media is the epitome of this? I mean, I like, I love social media. I, especially Twitter, that's where I like to spend my time. I'm a words person. But wow, you really need to stay on top of choosing which voices you're going to listen to, choosing which words or phrases to mute because you're, it can just get so screamy, so mob mentality, so confusing. And that mob mentality takes over really quickly. Doesn't matter what the issue is, what the story is. All of a sudden, we read a headline, and next thing you know, we're all posting. Hashtag, take a stand. And hashtag, thoughts and prayers. And hashtag, justice. And, and really, most of us have absolutely no knowledge or have done no research on the thing that we're talking about. We just saw a headline, and we jumped on the bandwagon. We may not even really understand why we're there, but whatever it is, boy, we're passionate about it. And, and then we don't do anything else. Literally, nothing is solved. We just feel like we did something. Mob mentality, confusion, it just causes this huge waste of energy and it accomplishes nothing. Here's the third kind of confusion that I saw in scripture. Confusion that paralyzes and destabilizes. You, you can't make up your mind. You can't come to a decision. You're flip-flopping back and forth. Both James and Paul in the New Testament talk about this in their letters to local churches. And they both make pretty strong statements about what happens when we let confusion take over in our hearts and in our minds. James chapter 1 verse 5, James says, If you need wisdom, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world and they are unstable in everything they do. It's confusion that paralyzes, that destabilizes. We get, we get stuck. Paul talks about it in his very straightforward way. He says when that happens, if we're getting stuck and thrown about like that, he says ever so gently, we need to grow up. He suggests that it's an issue of maturity, that, that, that we, there's maybe some immaturity that's happening. Let's call it room for growth. If we get paralyzed and destabilized by confusion, he says in Ephesians 4, 14, he was addressing this with them. He says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever, they sound like the truth. You know, some of us, Every time a new thought or a new idea comes along or a new voice enters the ring, we just, we just change direction and we go over here and then we go over there and then we go zigzag back and forth. My dad says sometimes there's some people that are like a seat cushion. They're just always the shape of the last person who sat on them. Paul calls it tossed and blown about. James calls it wavering and unstable. It's confusion that paralyzes and destabilizes us. We get stuck. And confusion is a deadly, effective bullet that comes at us and it will take us out 
if we're not ready. No wonder we need good shoes, good boots to make us ready for when it hits. So Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 15, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Be ready for this bullet. Be prepared and it's with peace. Not just a nice feeling, the solid peace that comes from Jesus, from the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, just before his crucifixion, Jesus was talking with his disciples and, and he knows, they don't get it, but he knows what's coming. And he's trying to prepare them for what was to come. He's trying to, he's trying to get them ready for what's going to be a really tough time. They're not getting it. And, it, and Jesus knows it's going to be, in a, in a very short time, it's going to be the most confusing time of their lives. They're going to see him die. They're going to, they're going to see his apparent defeat. And he wants them to be ready for it. And so he's talking with them and trying to help them to prepare. And he chats with them for a good while. It's really beautiful. All that, that he says, but there's a couple things that, that he drops, these little, these little bits that he drops that I have returned to again and again. One is in John 14, 27. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift. Say it with me, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. He knows they're about to go into the most confusing time of their lives. Nice feelings are not going to cut it. And so he says, I'm not giving you nice feelings. I'm giving you peace of mind and peace in your heart. It is more than anything the world has to offer. It's in me, Jesus says. It's peace that is based on Jesus. And he puts an instruction with it, a choice. Don't give in to fear. Don't give in to the confusion. Then he, um, he talks a little bit more <coughs> and he tells them that there's some tough stuff that's coming. And he says in John chapter 16, verse 33, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Yay. But take heart, Jesus says, because I have overcome the world. Again, he's talking about this peace and is right in the middle of trials. It's right in the middle of sorrows, right in the middle of a pandemic, right in the middle of the difficult stuff that we go through. Jesus says, I am giving you peace. It's peace that is based on Jesus, not based on the circumstances that we're in. And again, he attaches an instruction and says, Take heart. Remember, I have overcome. I'm bigger than this. He's telling them, he's telling his disciples, get ready. Put on the shoes of peace because it's going to get hard. And the shoes of peace, they're going to help you stand firm. This is going to be your foundation. Well, that's great. But, but Patty, how? how? How do we do that? Here's my ideas. You ready? Here we go. Number one, put on the peace shoes. Now, obviously it's a metaphor, but there really is an action verb in that scripture that we looked at. It said for shoes, put on the peace. It's an intentional thing. These are not just flip-flops that you slide on as the dog drags you out the door for the first walk of the day. I mean, it's sit down, put them on properly, lace them up, make sure they fit right. Take the time to put on the shoes. Patty, what do you mean? I mean, slow down. Listen, that, that peace that comes from Jesus, hear those words, take heart. I have overcome. Slow down, sit down, <laughs> shift your focus away from the trials and the sorrows and shift your focus towards Jesus. Take a deep breath and hear Jesus saying to you as you prepare for your day. Hear Jesus saying to you as you consider what's coming. Hear Jesus saying to you, take heart. I have overcome the world. And do that. 
before you go outside, before the confusion hits. Shift your mind to that. Be fully prepared, already standing firm on the peace of knowing that Jesus has already overcome all of it. Number two, pray when you're confused. And when you pray, listen and journal. Listen, James says, if you need wisdom, ask God. And most of us don't. Most of us don't. We say we're gonna. We say we have. We tell others to pray. We ask people to keep us in their prayers. And, and we say we're gonna pray and we do all of this, but we, most of us, we don't actually pray. We, we thought we were gonna pray, but we don't actually pray. We don't actually stop and talk to God and say, I need wisdom. And if we do, then we, we, we blurt out our need and we say, God, I need wisdom. And then we just wrap it all up with, in Jesus name, amen. And then we rush off and go out the door to our day and wonder why he didn't answer. Maybe he was about to, and you just hung up on him. I'm just saying, ask God for wisdom, lay it out, write it out. If that helps you process and then listen listen. What comes into your mind? What rises to the surface? Me, I'm a big fan of journaling because it forces me to slow down and it forces me to pay attention to what God might be saying. And you go, well, I don't know if it's God. That's okay. Lots of times I'm not sure either, but if I write it down, then I've got something to go back to, to pray over and to consider. Number three, choose your voices. Don't allow yourself to get blown around by every new idea or teaching that comes along. There is a weird idea out there that, it, that you aren't being open-minded and fair if you're not listening to all the voices all the time. I'm just going to go out on a limb and tell you I think that's nonsense. Yes, listen to diverse voices. Yes, listen and learn the experiences of others, but give each voice equal weight in your life? No. Give each voice equal weight in shaping you and your decisions? No. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, repeatedly, strongly told them, stop listening to people that are messing with your head. Listen, can I be blunt? On social media, some of us need to learn how to, how to use that unfollow button. And some of us need to learn how to use that mute button. And, and, and in real life or social media, I'm just going to give you a, I'm going to give you a little secret here. If somebody who is not helpful says to you, can I give you some advice? It's okay to smile and say, no, thanks. I'm good. You can do that. Choose who it is that you're listening to. Choose, uh, consider who you listen to and consider why you're listening to them and then choose the voices that are helping you. And number four, stop second guessing. Listen, if you've put the shoes on, if you have focused your mind on Jesus, if you have sought God's wisdom and you have prayed over it, if you have chosen your voices, then stop second guessing. You go, Patty, what if I make a mistake? Listen, your heavenly father has more than enough grace if you make a mistake. It's okay. Just don't let confusion paralyze you and stop you from doing anything. One more thing, and then we'll close. I've practiced this scripture for years. It's in Philippians chapter four, verse eight. And here's what Paul says. Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything that you heard from me and saw me doing. And then, then the God of peace will be with you. Would you pray this prayer with me? Lord, I choose today to put on shoes of peace so that I can stand firm when confusion comes. I choose to fix my thoughts on Jesus who has overcome the world. 
I choose to bring my confusion and questions to you and to prayerfully listen for your wisdom. I choose to hear the voices that help. And I choose to trust that your grace is more than enough to right my mistakes. I choose to stand on the foundation of peace that Jesus gives and trust that it is enough. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you found this helpful, we hope you join us at one of our campuses if you're in the GTA for a weekend gathering. If you're listening from somewhere else in the world, we'd encourage you to join us at onechurch.to slash live. We believe everyone can be a part of what Jesus is doing both in our community and in our city. So if you'd like to connect with us at a deeper level, visit us at onechurch.to slash next steps. See you next time.